This is Close Reads, a philosophy podcast with Mark and Wes. I'm Wes Alwyn. And I'm Mark Linsenmeyer. So we're looking at the 1975 paper from Paul Grice, Logic and Conversation. This was covered on the Partially Examined Life, but you don't have to have listened to that in order to appreciate this because we're doing a close read, of course. How are you doing, Wes? Good. How are you? Good. So this was the uh, paper where he is giving, he's accounting for uh, the sorts of assumptions that underlie conversation, parameters that make conversation make sense. We're going to skip the intro because he doesn't actually say anything about that (laughs) in the intro. The intro is just about how some philosophers think that natural language is too sloppy and some philosophers mm-hmm. think that that's okay and there's still logic within natural la- and he and he says actually i don't i'm not going to have anything to say about either of those but the, the the common assumption between the people debating the those two sides is that natural language does not have rules hey i'm going to give you some rules in natural language in its actual uh practice in the conversational practice it has so we're going to start at this uh, on the third page of the article called Implicature. Go Shall I read? Us. Sure. Suppose that A and B are talking about a mutual friend, C, who is now working in a bank. Or as I like to call it, D. Sorry. A asks B how C is getting on in his job. And B replies, oh, quite well, I think. He likes his colleagues and he hasn't been to prison yet. At this point, A might well inquire what B was implying, what he was suggesting, or even what he meant by saying that C had not yet been to prison. The answer might be any one of such things as that C is the sort of person likely to yield to the temptation provided by his occupation, that C's colleagues are really very unpleasant and treacherous people, and so forth. It might, of course, be quite unnecessary for A to make such an inquiry of B, the answer to it being, in the context, clear in advance. It is clear that whatever B implied, suggested, meant in this example is distinct from what B said, which was simply that C had not been to prison yet. I wish to introduce, as terms of art, the verb implicate and the related nouns implicature, implying, and implicate, implicatum, or what is implied. The point of this maneuver is to avoid having, on each occasion, to choose between this or that member of the family of verbs for which which implicate is to do general duty. And let's stop stop there for a second. So I'm not sure if this family of verbs is supposed to be implied, suggested, meant, (laughs) etc. that he just said, because those are all quite different things. And they're also different from entailed, which entailed would have something to do with uh, logical entailments that the speaker might not even be aware of, right? If you say that Superman Mm -hmm. is such and such, then you're implying that Clark Kent is such and such, even if you don't know that Superman is Clark Kent. I think we have to lean on the side of implicate. We're, We're still, this is still fundamentally something about what the speaker meant to say, as opposed to here are all the things that actually do logically come from what he says or the wide open space of what the hearer could read into it. We're talking about Mm -hmm. a successful communication between Mm -hmm. a a speaker and a hearer. Right. So he's, it's going to be a term of art. He wants to stick to a specific verb because he's going to build up some theoretical apparatus around that. And he doesn't need connotations from other possible meanings of other verbs or even this verb to interfere with that. So we get a very specific meaning of implicate mark as you just um, explicated it. All right. The point of this. Okay. So I already read that. I, yep. I shall for the time being, at least have to assume to a considerable extent, an intuitive understanding of the meaning of say in such contexts and an ability to recognize particular verbs as members of the family with which implicate is associated. I can, however, make one or two remarks that may help clarify the more 
problematic of these assumptions, namely that connected with the meaning of the word say. Uh, let me just keep going here. In the sense in which I'm using the word say, I intend what someone has said to be closely related to the conventional meaning of the words, the sentence he has uttered. Suppose someone to have uttered the sentence, he is in the grip of a vice, given a knowledge of the English language, but no knowledge of the circumstances of the utterance. One would know something about whether this, about what the speaker had said on the assumption that he was speaking standard English and speaking literally. One would know that he had said about some particular male person or animal X, that at the time of the utterance, wh whatever that was, so an utterance doesn't have to be words, it could even be mm -hmm. uh, a gesture. At the time of the utterance, either first, X was unable to rid himself of a certain kind of bad character trait, or second, some part of X's person was caught in a certain kind of tool or instrument, approximate account, of course. So let's just stop there. So, I mean, he's saying these are speaking standard English and speaking literally, and that two literal meanings of in the grip of a vice are, you know, actually grabbed by a tool, a vice, or unable to rid himself of a certain kind of bad character trait. Is that literally? Is it the the verb? I mean, a vice. I understand how that has two. Yes. Meaning, no, I know the question meanings. you're asking. I mean, the, the the problem is, yeah, a lot of literal meanings have their origins in metaphorical usage. So, you're pointing to the fact that it may be the case. It probably is the case that the use of vice to mean something vicious. Well, I don't know. I, I was actually thinking in the grip. Maybe I shouldn't be worried about this, but that. Well, no, I the know. Literal I know. grip versus the. Uh, I understand. I understand grip. what you're saying. Yeah. So. So yeah. So we, we, So there's vice, the the tool, and vice as in viciousness. Mm -hmm. And in any case, let's suppose that that the word vice is literally means the opposite of virtue it can still have its origins in a metaphorical usage of the machine that grips it doesn't mean it's non-literal literal be just because its origins are metaphorical many words if you look at them and it'll turn out that way the um the the, the river you know literally is running <laughs> even though it derives that literal usage from a figurative usage okay so in any, in any case, I'm just well, it's, I, it's not that I'm just saying the you know, the river, oh, it was figuratively the tree could be figuratively running, the trees are anyway, the trees are cascading down its branches or something like that. That's a figurative use, but sure, ahead. I'm I'm dwelling this, of course, because he's trying to make a distinction here between what is actually said and what is implicated by what is said, and I think maybe that that's not a distinction that one could make with particular clarity uh but i don't know let's i mean the fact that well, i think he exist. i mean i think you think of it like the what is what is said as in there's some proposition associated with the utterance some general proposition i think the way we've treated it traditionally with our our previous discussions in analytic philosophy it just is what it is there's a this one particular meaning, and that's the proposition. I think for Grice, that proposition or what is said literally is, is almost a general bucket, which a bunch of different things can fit into so that we, in a particular utterance, utterance it's fleshed out in its meaning, but at the level of what does it what does it mean, independent of speaker intent, that's quite generic. Which I think so. It's consistent with your intuition that it's not it doesn't fully have content in a way. I don't know if I'm explaining that very well. That's the impression I got from the other papers. Right. Let's let's keep going. I do want to say here that the yep. like his attempt to be precise, and I know I'm not going to belabor this point because I'm sure Dylan was ranting and raving on the regular podcast, which I was not on about this. But his attempt at precision to me makes things less clear. 
So you don't have to qualify vice the tool with you know um, a pro a certain kind of tool or instrument approximate account of course like all these attempts at nailing things down this is this is the caricature of an analytic philosophy and and for me all the ones and twos and a's and b's and c's make it much more difficult to follow right I almost that's read the, that's a, that's out of my system that's it you know a yeah. particular male person or animal x and I I would as I was just reading it aloud, it sounded like the animal is X, not that, that, you know, it, even putting in the animal there for this particular example does not seem useful. The main, yeah, you know, I don't. And why the are they vice? What I'm going to say that about a dog or a, a tiger anyway, you're right. But I guess, yes, in the grip, if we, if, if it's the other meaning he is, he has been trapped. There's an animal that that you have. It's put just in because place. we can refer to we can wow. refer to animals as he's. That's all. Yes. Yep. He wants to capture the extension of he. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. But for a full identification of what the speaker had said, one would need to know a the identity of X, that is the person who's person or animal, b the time of the utter the time of utterance, and c the meaning on the particular occasion of utterance of the phrase in the grip of a vice, a decision between those two options. This brief indication of my use of say leaves it open whether a man who says today, Harold Wilson is a great man, and another who says also today, the British Prime Minister is a great man, if each knew that the two singular terms had the same reference, have said the same thing. But what decision is made about this question, the apparatus that I'm about to provide will be capable of accounting for any implicatures that might depend on the presence of one rather than another of these singular terms in the sentence uttered. Such implicatures would be merely would merely be related to different maxims. Okay, so let, let me just setting aside that that Superman Clark Kent thing with, with that example. Mm -hmm. Whatever decision is made about the question of the open question of whether these two people making statements about someone under a different description whether they've said the same thing. Right. Okay. Um, his account of imp implicature will be able to account for either. Is that what he's saying? They would be related by to different maxims. Okay. I mean, this so, never comes up again in the article. So okay, I don't, good. I don't know what to All really right. tell you about that, but it does seem like it is a, a significant difference to which one of those you take that you know, that's the sense Frege's sense reference distinction that mm -hmm. I think you, you might want to define what is said by the sense. In other words, someone that says something about Superman, who, something who says something about Clark Kent has, has, those are two different statements. You have, there are different sayings. Uh, if we want to focus on the, the speaker's meaning, it matters if the person knows that those are the same, because then actually it is the same. Even if, even if he refers to him as soups, uh, you know, he knows that that means Superman who means Clark Kent. So he has said it's one in the same proposition for that speaker. I meant that that unitary proposition that that you might not understand is the same proposition. And when you say it, it might be you saying two different things. Mm -hmm. Is that just confuse matters or, I mean, I know it's not confusing for you because you know, sense reference. Mm -hmm. No, I think we can leave it at that. And right. then... Keep going. In some cases, the conventional meaning of the words used will determine what is implicated besides helping to determine what is said. If I say smugly, he is an Englishman. He is therefore brave. I have certainly committed myself by virtue of the meaning of my words. To its being the case that his being brave is a consequence, is a consequence of, follows from, his being an Englishman. But while I have said that he is an Englishman and said that he is brave, I do not want to say that I have said, in the favored sense, that it follows from his being an Englishman that he is brave, though I have certainly indicated and so implicated that this is so. So he's not said it. He's not explicitly said 
I don't know. Has he not explicitly said that? He's an I mean, Englishman, it, it therefore he's like brave. He's an Englishman, therefore he is, therefore brave. So you're saying three things. He's an Englishman, he is brave, and there's a logical connection between the two of those. They're all said right there. So I'm not sure what. what so I, have, I do not want to say I've said in the favorite sense. That's weird. I have indicated and implicated it, but I have not said it in the favored sense. What is the favored sense? Uh, so looking back to the beginning of the previous paragraph, I intend what someone has said to be closely related to the conventional meaning of the words, the sentence he has uttered. Uh, the conventional meaning of, yeah, I can't. I mean, that is the conventional meaning of yes, therefore. The word therefore. Well, okay. Is there some other meaning of therefore that I'm missing? Um, I mean, is there is is it is the distinction between in his case, he's an Englishman, therefore he is brave, but that's oh. actually different than saying all Englishmen are brave. Can we make that distinction? I think he's trying to say that you're actually only saying of this individual, but maybe you have mm. implicated the the general the general entailment i mean i'm not sure i guess we're we're part in part trying to figure out does that statement as it is listed actually entail the general all englishmen are brave i mean technically not i guess you could imagine a situation or a different sentence where uh you know maybe you're just saying englishmen tend to be brave and if you're the kind of well, person I think that's who, what he's saying now. I think the next sentence makes uh -huh. that clear. All right. I do not want to say that my utterance of the sentence would be strictly speaking false should the consequence in fail in question fail to hold. So even if it turns out he's not brave, he can still be an Englishman. That's a looser suggestion just what you said Mark. Englishmen tend to be brave, mm -hmm. but it's not a hard and fast. So so some implicatures are conventional, unlike the one with which I introduced this discussion of implicature. So right. some implicatures are conventional. They're not just. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, so again, the one he started with, he hasn't been to prison yet. Uh, I know. I know what you're like about to say. <laughs> that is conventional, right? Mm -hmm. When you say, um, it's like, you know, have you stopped beating your wife? Well, it it certainly suggests there that you were previously beating your wife. It would be an improper use of stop. And so the word yet there, it's not quite the same, but at least implies that there's some reason that he either should be in prison now or is likely to fall into temptation. Or maybe he's just joking around. I would if somebody said that to me, like, well, how are you doing at your job? I haven't been fired yet. Like, <laughs> am I really saying I suck so bad at my job that I should be fired? Am I, I mean, I'm just making a quip. I, it barely has any literal meaning at all. It's, it really just means I'm all right. It's okay. Yeah. I mean, it depends on context. Yeah. It could mean you suck at your job. It could mean everyone's out to get you, even though you're great at your job or, or not, but, um, it, it could just be a joke. Right. So, so, yeah, I mean, it, that, that's a good example in, with the, in the way of the way a single utterance can mean a lot of different things based on implicature, which always involves context. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about pragmatics and, and this is not unrelated to the stuff we talked about with Tomasello because the idea there was that a lot of what goes on when we understand a communication involves context and our attunement to other people's consciousness of that context. But go ahead. I wish to represent a certain subclass of non-conventional implicatures, which I shall call conversational implicatures, as being essentially connected with certain general features of discourse. So my next step is to try to say what these features are. Have we made it clear enough what a conventional implicature is well it sounds like the therefore right uh i mean i would think it's 
even a euphemism that is commonly used, right? I just uh, drop the kids off at the pool as I'm coming out of the bathroom. That that is a conventional implicature. It is. Uh, but I could a mean, subclass of okay. Yeah. If if you're if if a particular speaker means something that is outside what you could potentially find in a slang lexography of the phrase, for instance, uh, you know, not a common use, a completely common use of the term, a different one that he uses in the other, uh, one of the other papers is if I shall be helping the grass grow, blah, blah, blah. And, and, and it, it's revealed that the, the speaker meant when I'm dead. You know, mm -hmm. so no, I get what you're un saying. Yeah, I, unlike pushing up the daisies, which is now, even though that's also a metaphor, that is a conventional implicature. This would be an unconventional one. It just works in the context. Yeah. His example in the previous paragraph is a simpler example. It's just therefore. In some cases, the conventional meaning of the words will determine what is implicated. Therefore. The therefore is the conventional, is our is one of our content conventional terms for implicature uh, maybe you know we didn't really note that if i say parentheses smugly he's an englishman therefore does the smugly add anything does it add a it's an, it, it doesn't imply whimsy or i'm you know saying something in the same offhand way right is this well he's not being anything? he's not being ironic he's being uh -huh. a nationalist he's being yeah. self-centered according to his nationality and, and believe you know earnestly believes it so i think it's that seems to rule out irony or it seems to rule out a dr spock who has done population <laughs> research and wants to make general <laughs> statements about the qualities of certain groups yeah all right why don't you keep going um following me provide okay so my so my next step is to try to say what these features are the following may provide a first approximation to a general principle our talk exchanges do not normally consist of a succession of disconnected remarks and would not be rational if they did they are characteristically to some degree at least cooperative efforts and each participant recognizes in them to some extent a common purpose or set of purposes or at least a mutually accepted direction. This purpose or direction may be fixed from the start, for example, by an initial proposal of a question for discussion, or it may evolve during the exchange. It may be fairly definite, or it may be so indefinite as to leave very considerable latitude to the participants as in a casual conversation. But at each stage, some possible conversational moves would be excluded as conversationally unsuitable. We might then formulate a rough general principle which participants will be expected, ceteris paribus, to observe. Namely, make your conversational contribution such as is required at the stage at which it occurs by the accepted purpose or direction of the talk exchange in which you are engaged. One might label this the cooperative principle. So, this is so at this point, that's, yeah. yeah, to me, rather vague at this point, but go ahead say something yeah is this positing that there is a single language game or insofar as something is a conversation i mean there might be of course many many different language games within that rubric you know the transaction that you are doing at a bank or you know in any sort of vendor purchaser relation versus a romantic conversation you know there are all these but just the fact that it is a conversation it's going to have some features of what you're allowed to do and not to do that are going to far overshadow. I'm not sure that he actually says this, but far overshadow the differences between the various languages. Do you think that is accurate so far as you can tell in the abstract? Well, let me, before I get to that problem, I think here what he's saying is, so we might normally think about well, what what makes sense, what makes an utterance meaningful, 
And we can think about that strictly in terms of the grammar of the language. So that such that dog night skim later has no meaning. It's not well constructed, but that's not enough. There's a lot more that has to go on for us to be doing something meaningful or that wouldn't seem crazy or nonsense to a, another participant. We have to link propositions together in a certain way so that that insight or a link utterances together in a certain way that that's an insight, which I find, you know, re really interesting. So, and then the other, okay. So the other element of this is that you're saying that these are that sort of rule is broader than the rule of any particular language game. And that seems right in the way it seems to characterize language games in general, which is that there is some telos, there is some purpose or direction that characterizes the game. And that we expect people to make moves that respect that goal. And if they don't are, if they're not oriented towards the purpose, then we think what's wrong with you <laughs> what right, is going I, on i think i think ones that are harder to see as using the cooperative principle it's because they might not actually be conversations that an interrogation not sure that counts as a conversation because you are mm -hmm. it's just it's one willingness of both parties right or threatening someone as they run away you know <laughs> that's not a conversation, even if the person then yells something back, I'm just not sure that that counts. This is what annoys me about academics using this word interrogate in their mm. writing as a metaphor. I'm going to interrogate the whatever it is that they're interrogating. Don't say interrogate unless you have someone in a room, you know, stripped down to their undershirt, tied to a chair, and you've got. <laughs> You've got a battery with some um, electric cables nearby. Don't use that I, I, word. I think you Don't use have, that word as a metaphor. It's obnoxious. And you're I not interrogating. It's... You're just making your own feeble human attempts at understanding something, hopefully, or saying something. You're not a master interrogator who's going to no. dazzle us with how you torture something out of the text. But go well, Wes, ahead. what yeah. is an interrogative? <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Okay. All right. I know. I know. <laughs> But it, that's I, that I, kind of fancy wordplay. It's wordplay. It's double entendre. And it's, it's funny stupid. though that that is what we now see as the basic meaning, but really it just means questioning, and it's only as this. No, went, it doesn't. Yes, if if <laughs> interrogative means a question, yeah, but that doesn't mean interrogate. Means or at least originally meant to question, and so it it, it doesn't. It you know the associations we have of, of being extreme interrogation have now taken over the word interrogation and that's the first thing that comes to mind for us that's, it that's, doesn't have to be an extreme uh, interrogation there's just an element of coercion and, and yeah you're right that literally if you take it a, a literal word origin we could just say it means question but um so so you think it's the it's a what it means to jump back to the original if since it no longer means that as a primary thing then it actually is just using it as a metaphor as a, as a hyperbole to to uh, yeah the metaphorical meaning mundane. the metaphorical meaning is the literal meaning <laughs> and the literal meaning is no longer the meaning All right cooperative principle we've set up on the on the assumption that some such general principle as this is acceptable one may perhaps distinguish four categories under one one or another which under one or another of which will fall certain more specific maxims and sub maxims, the following of which will in general yield results in accordance with the cooperative principle. Echoing Kant, I call these categories quantity, quality, relation, and manner. The category of quantity relates to the, okay, did we want to say anything about, he's, he's making a, a needless comparison to mm. Kant here because they're really not preconcept i when i saw that originally i i wasn't thinking oh it's just because he's using the same words kant did that that these are preconceptions that these are something that we go into the conversation expecting these are the a priori conditions of a conversation i mean maybe that's why he's making this reference here okay 
That's interesting. Uh, I hadn't yeah. thought about this. Yeah, go ahead. The category of quantity relates to the quantity of information to be provided. And in, under it, follow the following maxims. Number one, make your contribution as informative as is required for the current purpose of the exchange. And number two, do not make your contribution more informative that is required. And he says, there's a big parenthetical. The second maximum is disputable. It might be said that to be over-informative is not a transgression of the of the CP, the cooperative principle, but merely a waste of time. However, it might be answered that such over-informativeness may be confusing in that it is liable to raise side issues. And there may also be an indirect effect in that the hearers may be misled as a result of thinking that there is some particular point in the provision of the excess of information. However this may be, there is perhaps a different reason for doubt about the admission of this second maxim, namely that its effect will be secured by a later maxim, which concerns relevance. Yeah, there's a psychological term for this, which I'm forgetting when people just go on and on with irrelevant speech and it's, it's used diagnostically. But of course, if you're lying on the couch you're, and you're free associating, then everything is relevant. And it would be weird not to say everything that comes into your head, even if it isn't connected to the conversation in, in a typical way. But in general, yeah, it's really weird if someone goes into down these avenues with lots of details that don't end up paying off, that don't end up hooking up to the rest of the account. Like, well, why did you, why did you tell me about <laughs> X, Y, and Z if it wasn't, you know, important to the overall purpose of the conversation? I'm wondering if, if we want to say that, you know, which Grace does not say that a police interrogation is borderline, not a conversation at all then you might want to think therapy is also borderline, not a conversation at all, because it is such, it, yes, it involves mm -hmm. two people talking and their expectations and their rules. And so a lot of the characteristics of, I mean, even in a police interrogation, if, if the, the suspect sat down and the policeman just started going, <laughs> you'd maybe something's gone wrong, or is that just, well, that could be an interrogative te a technique that the person is using. I'm I'm just trying to freak you out, and you know, so it's it's sort of like you're training a dog. That is not a conversation, and so sort of whatever works, whatever you think. But it still mm -hmm. seems like if the if then the, the 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 interrogator has a purpose and is doing something that there actually is no strategy behind, then they violated at least that they're playing outside of the room the rules of that language game. So it's certainly a language game, even if it's not a conversation. You're reminding me of uh, the show called The Patient with Steve Carell. Have you watched any of that? I forget. Is, that is it on he... Hulu maybe? But he's kidnapped by one of his patients who turns out to be a serial killer because the patient wants to have as much time with him as possible and actually do therapy in the basement. He's like, I'm going to make you, you know, be my 24-7 therapist. And one thing that the Carell character says is that we can't really do therapy under the circumstances of fear and, you know, so me being afraid that I'm going to die or being confined here against my will doesn't work for therapy. And I would say that that's, there's, there's an analogy there to interrogation in which there's the conversation there is no conversation because it involves this physical it involves physical force as an externality it's not cooperation towards a goal mm -hmm. it's the use of force and that's that you know that's an interesting contrast and i mean with big political implications but in the case of therapy it is a cooperative effort even if it's a weird type of conversation and the therapist does say something sometimes and they are communicating with each other and they do there is a goal and there's cooperative principles and so i think there can be lots of different types of conversations with very different characteristics and goals and hence more finely grained rules about how they're supposed to operate and what grice is doing here is giving us some very general rules about what those conversations will nevertheless observe. So informative as required, that's quite vague. In some conversational situations, that means giving lots and lots and lots of information. In some, it means 
you know, really keeping it to a minimum. Well, and when you, so all these rules are put forward such that when somebody violates them, they're not necessarily no longer having a conversation or they're opting out of the conversation, but they are, as our guest was saying, uh, rules that are made to be broken because they give us a, a signal that you're meaning something beyond the literal meaning that maybe you are saying so little saying less than it seems like you should in the situation because you're actually trying to convey i'm not allowed to talk about this this is something i'm uncomfortable talking about or or if you're giving too much information well this is this was a point that we were arguing about in the episode is does implicature always refer to things that the speaker actually meant in a in a broad sense because if somebody is saying if you ask someone in a police interrogation where were you on this night and they start going into a lot of very specific detail then that might sound rehearsed that might certainly the the person who's saying it does not mean to to make it sound rehearsed right mm -hmm. he, he's trying to get away with something but it might give evidence which would be a form of not non-natural meaning not the meaning in the speaker's head but natural meaning a symptom of something about the speaker so that I, I think violations of a lot of these rules, at least the listener is going to take as a symptom that something is going wrong. Maybe a symptom that not 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 just something about the implicature about what the, the speaker means, but a symptom that like, hey, you don't actually know what language game we're playing, right? <laughs> that, mm -hmm. You know, that's that's not part of the speaker's meeting, but that is what the hearer would. It is information that is being imparted by what is being said to the mm -hmm. to the hearer. And so does that, does that count as an implicature, even if it's something that was not meant? I don't think under his description, it does. Right. Okay. But do I, but maybe I don't know enough yet. Well, let's, um, let's keep, let's okay. keep going. Read, read the quality one. Under the category of quality falls a super maxim. Try to make your contribution one that is true and two more specific maxims. Do not say what you believe to be false. Do not say that for which you lack adequate evidence. Under the okay, so let's that's quality. And he's going to give more detail in each of these, whether we'll get to it or not. I I don't know. Uh, let's just now is that okay? All right, oh, we, we could discuss that later. But yeah, is that is that always true that we're expected to be truthful and? I mean, I suppose it is. I'm, I'm just trying to think of kind of, and I don't think it violates it if people are in a situation where they're uh, imparting fiction to each other. But well, that the, yeah, this is one of the things when he gets in the details on this that he's going to say there are plenty of particular conversations where saying something that is literally false is illuminating and clues the li the listener into the non conventional conversational mm -hmm. implicature of what is being said that if you yep. use a metaphor then the person you know if you're talking to a computer they might just not understand what you're doing or sarcasm uh, but, is a good example where you right. say the opposite of what you yep. mean yeah. all right so all let's right. keep going under the category of relation i place the single maxim namely be relevant though the maxim itself is terse its formulation conceals a number of problems that exercise me a good deal. Questions about what different kinds and focuses of relevance there may be, how these shifts in the course of a talk exchange, no. how these shift in the course of a talk exchange, a, that's a conversation is a talk exchange. <laughs> a, <laughs> how to allow for the fact that subjects of conversation are legitimately changed and so on. I find the treatment of such questions exceedingly difficult and I hope to re revert to them in a later work. Finally, under the category of manner, which I understand as relating not like the previous categories to what is said, but rather to how what is said is to be said, I include the super maxim, be, pers be perspicuous, and various maxims such as avoid obscurity of expression, avoid ambiguity, be brief, avoid unnecessary prolixity, be orderly, and one might need others. 
and as he's gonna say pretty soon, you know, this is not all the manner of uh this does not include uh you know be be polite or something, he's gonna say in the next look looking at a paragraph. Uh so it's it's a little I'm not sure exactly what how how do you think manner is that a fundamentally different mode if it's about how it is to be said? If that's really different, because, you know, be brief, un avoid unnecessary prolixity. Well, that sounds like quantity. It sounds like what he's already said. Uh, I think I think what he. Clarity kind of example, is the thing. So. Yeah, exactly. The kind of example he has in mind is don't use a, a $10 word when you can use a, a, a dollar word or whatever the, the expression for that is. Um, that that is just putting barriers between you and the listener. I mean, let's come up for different with different names for these. Like what we manner, I would just call clarity. Yeah. Right. Because and even being orderly is about stating things yeah. in a clear order. Relation, I would just call. Um, relevance. Salience. Relevance. Sal yeah. Salience. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Quality, truthfulness, or. Yeah, because quality then, is too broad because that includes, like, if you contribute irrelevant things, you are making a poor quality contribution to the conversation. You're not helping it go forward and to mm -hmm. achieve its goals. So quality is just too broad to cover that. And then quantity. Um, maybe that's, maybe, I don't know if there's a better word, okay. but, that one's okay. but in any case, you, you know. It would have been a lot easier to keep these in their in one's head if he had just used more reasonable words. But he's it's almost as if if he's viol as if he's violating his own principles. <laughs> he's using these needlessly fancy terms in order to come up with a parody to Kant, and I always just it means that I just have trouble remembering what they are unless I look back at these definitions. Okay, which one is this? Which one is this? You know. All right. Uh, where were we? Is it, it is obvious. Yeah. It is obvious that the observance of some of these maxims is a matter of less urgency than is the observance of others. A man who has expressed himself with undue prolixity would in general be open to milder comment than a man who has said something he believes to be false. Indeed, it might be felt that the importance of at least the first maxim of quality is such that it should not be included in a scheme of the kind I am constructing. Other maxims come into operation only on the assumption that this maxim of quality is satisfied. While this may be correct, so far as the gener generation of implicatures is concerned, it seems to play a role not totally different from the other maxims, and it will be convenient for the present at least to treat it as a member of the list of maxims. I don't know if you thought uh, of, was it Davidson, that somebody that we have to, for conversation to make sense, assume that people in general are telling the truth, right? Otherwise we wouldn't yeah. know what the meanings of words are at all. And so right. if you're like, you read this and what conversations include, you know, assume that we're telling the truth. Don't people lie all the time? Well, people might lie pretty frequently, but still 90, 99% of the things they say are true. Cause otherwise you wouldn't understand that they were even speaking English. Mm-hmm. Yep. Or I don't know what the what the the percentage would have to be. Certainly if they were telling the truth less than half the time, we would really be confused by each other. Right. I mean, he needs to tell us why how it is that quality uh undergirds the other maxims exactly. He hasn't done that, but I get the general point. I mean, the exception is if you have a twin brother who always tells the truth and you can always lie and as long as you're giving directions to people together then they can you know use their logical mm. brain to figure out right right all right uh there are of course all sorts of other maxims aesthetic social or moral in character such as be polite that are also normally observed by participants in talk exchanges and these may also generate non-conventional implicatures the conversational maxims, however, and the conversational implicatives connected with them 
are specifically connected, I hope, with the particular purpose that talk, and so exchange, is adapted to serve, and is primarily employed to serve. I've stated my maxims as if this purpose were a maximally effective exchange of information. This specification is, of course, too narrow, and the scheme needs to be generalized to allow for such general purposes as influencing or directing the actions of others. Okay. Different sorts of speech acts, not just description, are at stake. Different goals other than informing others are at stake. Yeah, and this even leaves open... I know he eventually... I'm trying to think. Certainly in his meaning paper, he he considers cases where there are not two people actually talking. That if you are if you are trying to influence or direct the actions of others, uh, yeah, is that a borderline conversation? Certainly, if you're doing it through like adver- posted advertisements, well, that's not a conversation at all. Even though it is an activity that is uh, assumes that conversation exists, right? That it's only because we can talk to each other in person that it makes sense that I can send a letter or post a sign that's aimed at you or at the general, a, jo- a, a wider general public that I don't know who the audience is exactly mm. writing for posterity, writing in my own diary, perhaps for no one. Mm. Um, as one of my avowed aims, sorry, as one of my avowed aims is to see talking as a special case or variety of purposive, indeed rational behavior it may be worth noting that the specific expectations or presumptions connected with at least some of the foregoing maxims have their analogs in the sphere of transactions that are not talk exchanges. I list briefly one such analog for each conversational category. Quantity. If you're assisting me to mend a car, I expect your contribution to be neither more nor less than is required. If, for example, at a particular stage I need four screws, I expect you to hand me four rather than two or six. Quality. I expect your contributions to be genuine and not spurious. If I need sugar as an ingredient in the cake you're assisting me to make, I do not expect you to hand me salt. If I need a spoon, I do not expect a trick spoon made of rubber. Relation. I expect a partner's contribution to be appropriate to the immediate needs at each stage of the transaction. If I'm mixing ingredients for a cake, I do not expect to be handed a good book or even an oven cloth, though this might be an appropriate contribution at a later stage. Manner, I expect a partner to make it clear what contribution he is making and to execute his performance with reasonable dispatch. All right, let's just get the second next paragraph out there, too, so we can see what he how he thinks this relates to the speech ones, you know, beyond the obvious that you can apply these four things to it. These analogies are relevant to what I regard as a fundamental question about the CP, the conversational cooperative principle, the cooperative principle, and it's a tenant. Let's just say, let's say the full thing. Okay. We have enough abbreviations and acronyms. Yeah. Go ahead. It's a tenant. These analogies are relevant to what I regard as a fundamental question about the cooperative principle and its attended maxims, namely what the basis is for the assumption, which we seem to make and on which I hope it will appear that a great range of implicatures depend that talkers will in general, ceteris paribus, and in the absence of indications of the contrary, proceed in the manner that these principles prescribe. In other words, that normally people follow them. A dull, but no doubt at a certain level adequate answer is that it is just a well-recognized empirical fact that people do behave in these ways. They have learned to do so in childhood and not lost the habit of doing so. And indeed, it would involve a good deal of effort to make a radical departure from the habit. It is much easier, for example, to tell the truth and to invent lies. I am, however, enough of a rationalist to want to find a basis that underlies these facts, undeniable though they may be. I'd like to be able to think that the standard type of conversational practice, I would like to be able to think of the standard type of conversational practice, not merely as something that all or most do in fact follow, but as something that it is reasonable for us to follow, something that we should not abandon. For a time, I was attracted by the idea that observance of the, the uh, cooperative principle and the maxims in a talk exchange <laughs> would be thought of as a quasi-contractual matter with parallels outside the realm of discourse. If you pass by when I'm struggling with my stranded car, I no doubt have some degree of expectations you will offer help. But once you join me in tinkering under the hood, my expectations become stronger and take more specific forms. 
in the absence of indications that you are merely an incompetent meddler. And talk exchanges seem to me to exhibit characteristically certain features that jointly distinguish cooperative transactions. Uh, should we All read right. the example? Let's well, I'll just say in general that I, you know, I think, so Tomasello was, I think, impressed not just by Wittgenstein, but by Grice. And the, the fundamental idea is that language use is a case of, it is a particular case of cooperation. Mm -hmm. And it is built upon certain cooperative principles that we see in non-linguistic behavior as well. And I think that's really important especially if we're trying to think about how there could be such a thing as language at all, which is very mysterious until we start thinking about our capacity to read other people's intentions and engage in cooperative behavior. And those two things are very closely related. I mean, I wonder if language game as, as catchy a term as that is, you know, it should it should be subsumed under games that I know that seems obvious, but uh, the whole point of of arguing that language games exist is that when we are that any cooperative enterprise, you know, that you I guess game could just be cooperative enterprise. Is there any is there any problem? Because it implies that there's some loose rules that you are doing. I don't know. Uh, are there rules? Well, I think I'm the way the Wittgenstein, Wittgenstein describes the workers who are handing each other tools and cooperatively engaged in construction, that is a game. That is right. That is where he begins with that type mm -hmm. of activity and calls it a game, if I'm not mistaken. So and we, is he defining I think, it? So I think you're right. Is he defining the term game? Or is he defining it in terms of of some previous notion of game that we already have? Yeah, I think there's some trouble with that, right? I think we saw in our last... It, doesn't that lead us into quite a bit of a circle if we try to give necessary and sufficient conditions for what it is to be a game? Mm. I can't remember. In any case, uh, we, <laughs> all right. We could so, see, what are the what are the features that jointly distinguish cooperative transactions? Right. We're trying to say that there are in cooperative transactions, whether you want to call these games or not, or say game was just a metaphor to clue you in on what I mean by the fact that there are rules to things. That conversation, any sort of language transaction, most of which are conversations, involves certain rules just for it to make sense right it's not that you're if you're impolite you still make sense right there if you talk with a uh, Im improper grammar or you are you know you seem oh what a bore you seem I, I don't know this is this is sort of getting it right because it says giving too much information you're violating the rules of the game but are you violating it aesthetically or are you violating it so I just don't understand what you're talking to. I think it has to be the latter as far as Grice is concerned. So there are there are multiple reasons why you might not want to talk too much. The one that he's concerned with is is because if you do, I'll be like, are, wait, are we having this conversation? Why, why are you saying, I, I just don't understand what's going on here. Well, giving too much information, yeah, could have implications for clarity, which is to say mm -hmm. for manner. But it is strictly speaking the quantity category. So, what is the reason for not giving too much information? The idea is that we expect the information to have some purpose. And if it doesn't have any purpose, then what? Our time is being wasted or we're being. Con it, it seems like, you know, Maybe it seems like maybe that one is reducible to a clarity problem or something. I don't know. Well, yeah, he, he was asking before, maybe we should put quality as the master one because, you know, like the Davidson thing I referred to, unless we're generally telling the truth, then like we just have can't have conversation at all. But I, it almost might be clarity is the master one. And clarity defines 
all the rest of them is mm -hmm. are we do we both understand that we're having a conversation that's the fundamental clarity it's a secondary clarity i guess the specific one that the the maxima is referring to is do i understand the specific thing that you are trying to say but there are other types of unclarity that would make me doubt whether you even know you're talking to me maybe you're on your cell phone and i thought you were talking to me but you're talking in your headset it's all about the purpose of the game and whether we're obeying the rules of the game, which is to say whether we in, are engaged in actual cooperation. And so it makes sense that cooperation falls apart if we're not being truthful. It falls apart if the, you know, it, you know, the relation category, if you stop respecting the, the goal of the transaction, I can see that manner, clarity, quantity, though, is a bit of an odd category, because it's not that you're directly contradicting the goal of the game. It's just that you're doing extra stuff <laughs> on top of the cooperation. And maybe it's just too hard to be cooperative while you're doing all this extra stuff. So I guess his example outside of the language game is I need four screws. If you hand me six, let's just take the example of you handing me six. So I, yeah, quantity is also providing too little information. So I have to revise what I just said. Too little information can grind the conversation through a halt, but so can too much. I don't know. Let's we should move going. on. We should keep going, but I, I think we're out of time for this. Yeah. Uh, I, I, yeah. Um, here, let me just read the, the three part thing. And this is, seems a fine ending on page 48 here. The, so this was a uh, talk exchanges seem to be to exhibit characteristically certain features that jointly distinguish cooperative transactions. Here they are. Number one, the participants must have some common immediate aim, like getting a car mended. Their ultimate aims may, of course, be independent and even in conflict. Each may want to get the car mended in order to drive off, leaving the other stranded. In characteristic talk exchanges, there is a common aim, even if, as in an over-the-wall chat, it is a second-order one, namely that each party should, for the time being, identify himself with the transitory conversational interests of the other. Number two, the contributions of the participants should be dovetailed, mutually dependent. And number three, there's some understanding, which may be explicit, but which is often tacit, that other things being equal, the transaction should continue in appropriate style unless both parties are agreeable that it should terminate. You do not just shove off or start doing something else. Um, so yeah, anything we want to wrap common up? Common goal. This all speaks to having a common goal and a recognition of when the goal has been achieved. They but, should be mutually dependent. I sh what I say should actually depend on what you say. If I'm just saying stuff and then pausing so you could say whatever and then saying something else that I want to say, as might happen on some podcasts, mm -hmm. uh, that's not actually a conversation. Right. All right. Let's leave it there and then we can, I think that's a good place to start. Again, we can explore that more in our next episode. All right. So you like this enough that, that we shouldn't just consider. Yeah, this. I think we should just, it's only six more page or 12 more pages. So this will, this is, the, this will be the, we got through six pages or five and a half pages today. Sure. So that's all right. This is interesting enough. We're going to have a, a second part of this for those that are signed up for close reads, uh, at, at patreon.com slash close reads philosophy. Uh, thanks. Thanks.